Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior, next on Enviro Close Up. Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I am Carl Grossman. The subject, Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior, a ship that sails the world highlighting environmental outrages. With us is Peter Wilcox, captain of the new and third Rainbow Warrior. Hello, Captain Wilcox. Hi, pleased to be here. Captain Wilcox, please discuss the mission of the Rainbow Warrior. Well, Greenpeace has a number of things it's, it works on, and a number of them are on the ocean, whether it goes from uh, dumping of nuclear waste at sea to the transporting of nuclear waste to the dumping of toxic waste on third world countries to saving the whales or seals or fisheries campaigns, climate change, all of these things at some time or another need a boat to help out with the, the issues. So the Rainbow Warrior does whatever job we need to do, whatever job Greenpeace is working on. And the ones I've just listed are just some of the ones we've worked on over the last 30 years. Now you were on the original Rainbow Warrior when in 1985 it was bombed by French agents in New Zealand, killing a Dutch photographer, Fernando Piera. Please describe this episode. Well, 1985 was our year of protesting nuclear testing in the Pacific. Our first mission was in the Marshall Islands where a group of islanders had been used basically as guinea pigs to test the results of nuclear fallout. What would happen on a controlled population? Um, we've never proven that it was intentional, but it was everything but because for the atomic bomb tests in the early 50s, late 40s, the people from Rongelap Island were moved off their atoll so they wouldn't be in the fallout range. When the U.S. did the first hydrogen bomb test, the Bravo shot, which I think was in 1955, they were left on their atoll. This was a bomb that was a thousand times more powerful than the bombs that landed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was a 20 megaton blast. Um, they were left on their island. It snowed that day, radioactive fallout. Nobody was prepared for it. The children played in it. They thought it was snow. After three days, they were suffering from severe radiation sickness, vomiting, diarrhea, hair loss. All the people that were there during the test contracted thyroid cancer. Uh, one or two died of leukemia. The long-term health effects included multiple miscarriages, stunted growth, uh, retarded children, premature aging. It was an absolutely horrible experience. Now, after the test, they were moved off their atoll. They were monitored by the scientists at Brookhaven Laboratory on Long Island. After three years, they were moved back to Rongelap, and that's when their background radiation levels started increasing, but they were left on the island. And that, to me, is the, the most telling fact of the whole issue. Anyway, after a generation of seeing declining health, they began to ask to be moved to another atoll. Uh, the U.S. government, which had just spent $100 million trying to clean up Bikini in what was, in many ways, a wasted effort, didn't want to have to go to any more expense. And the Marshall's government was completely subservient to the U.S. after the war, refused them. And when they heard Greenpeace was bringing a ship, they contacted us and we said, would you please move us to a safe place to live? And we did. We moved 350 people, most of their building materials, uh, as much as we could on the old Rainbow Warrior. And that was our first campaign in 1985 on nuclear testing. Then we went down to New Zealand to prepare to leave for French Polynesia that had also been doing nuclear testing there. 
The French government was extremely nervous about Greenpeace bringing a large ship to French Polynesia, uh, sent a team to New Zealand, planted bombs on the outside of the boat, blew it up. We lost our crew member, Fernando Pereira, the only crew member that had two children. Uh, and we lost the boat. Uh, she sank in about 30 seconds. Uh, you can see pictures everywhere of the first hole that was blown in that was big enough to drive a small car through. They've used far, far more explosives than they would have if they just wanted to disable the ship. They said they weren't trying to kill anybody, but I think it's quite obvious they didn't care if they did kill anybody. They planted the bombs and they never warned us. They went off at quarter or 12 at night when people were sleeping in their cabins. And we were probably quite fortunate only to lose one crew member. Uh, the French agents were caught more or less red-handed two days later trying to return a rental car to the airport. Uh, after questioning, they were put in a hotel and immediately called up DSEG headquarters in Paris while the New Zealand police were recording the entire conversation. And the next day they were arraigned for second degree murder. The result of that was they pleaded guilty, received a 10 year sentence, and after one year the French government stopped unloading New Zealand agricultural products in Europe. Uh, so New Zealand released the prisoners. They were supposed to go to the French military base for three years, but immediately were flown back to, to France to a hero's welcome. Uh, that, was the, that was the episode in 1985. That's what we were doing. The reason I tell the story like I do, because it wasn't just the tense French that were testing in the Pacific, it was also the Americans. And in some ways, the American behavior towards the people they were testing around was much more severe than what the French were doing. Remember that after World War II, the conquered territories were divided up as trust territories administered by the United Nations. Germany was given and divided between Russia, France, England, and the United States. The territories in the Pacific were what were called strategic trust territories that instead of being monitored by the UN General Assembly were monitored by the UN Security Council where the US has veto power. So instead of bringing the Marshall Islands into the 20th century and improving their, their industry, improving their education system, protecting them, we pretty much use them as a testing ground for our nuclear weapons. I think it's an extremely shameful section of our history which really goes on today because we're still doing our Star Wars testing there. And the slum at Ebai on Kwajalein Atoll is as bad as anything South Africa did, where the local people aren't allowed to go to the, the scientifically held U.S. island to shop or use the banks or to be anything but domestic servants. And the overcrowding on Ebai is by far the worst in all the Pacific with the highest teenage suicide rate. That's really the result of our benevolence to the Marshall Islanders, and I think it's something that we have a lot to make up for. So that was our first mission in the Pacific in 1985. We never got to complete the second because the French were so nervous by that point that they blew the ship up. What you're referring to in connection to Star Wars are the, the rockets launched with some regularity by the United States from the Vandenberg Air Force Base to go up into space and then fall on Kwajalein. Yes, that's absolutely correct. There's quite an infrastructure to support that testing site on Kwajalein. And Kwajalein is in the Marshall Islands. Yeah, Kwajalein is the biggest coral atoll in the world. It's one of the Marshall Islands atolls. There is one island on Kwajalein that holds the U.S. scientific personnel. And a few miles away, there's a much smaller island that holds, say, 10 times the number of Marshallese. And it's an apartheid system, much like South Africa, where the Marshallese who live on Ebai are not allowed to shop or do anything on Kwajalein other than act as domestic servants. Uh, it's still going on, and it's still, I think, a really shameful thing that we're doing. From outrages to human beings in the Pacific to outrages against another mammal in the Pacific and waters all over the world, whales, 
Rainbow Warrior has been very involved in challenging whaling. Describe how, Captain. Right, well that was one of the first campaigns that Greenpeace started was uh, trying to protect the whales that were being killed off the California coast. And it's a campaign that we're still passionately involved in. Uh, we're also concerned with fisheries issues in the oceans. I believe that the oceans are a resource held by man in total. And our, what we're doing now with the oceans is letting the rich companies, the rich countries, uh, over-harvest, over-exploit, trash out the oceans, and make them a considerably less useful resource to everyone they would be if we managed them correctly. We have got to come up with a management system for fishing on the ocean. I mean, a farmer would never plant a field and then when the carrots come up, harvest everything. But that's so similar to what's happening on the ocean. We're now fishing trawlers are trawling down at a mile under the ocean. I was just in off the coast of Scotland and Ireland three months ago uh, protesting fishing there. I've seen it happen in New Zealand. It happens all over. The oceans of the world out past 200 miles, it's the wild, wild west. There's no controls. They're flag of convenience fishing boats. They're factory ships that pick them up. And we're not managing the oceans as we should. And we have a moral obligation when there's so many people in the world that need food. We have a moral obligation to manage that resource in the most sensible way, not to be dictated by large fishing companies who are trying to make money. And that's got to change. Describe how Rainbow Warrior confronts this ravaging of marine life in the, in the oceans. Well, for one thing, just by being there, uh, we're able to illustrate what's going on. In New Zealand six or seven years ago when we were there on the second Rainbow Warrior, we were able to document large pieces of coral that the trawlers were ripping off the bottom from 5,000 foot depths. Uh, just to expose that led to a change down there. I'm not, I can't remember if they outlawed it, but it proved that the fishing industry was creating destruction of the ocean floor, which is a necessary habitat of the fish. You can't haul these huge trawl nets like they do in Alaska, New Zealand, all over the place along the ocean floor and not damage the environment. And the small corals that exist on the ocean floor in Alaska, in New Zealand, all over the world, are a necessary habitat of the fish. Uh, what we were doing in Ireland and Scotland just a few months ago is we were trying to attach floats to the fishing cables of the trawl nets which would slide down and lift the nets off the bottom so they'd have to haul their nets in and start over again. Uh, we do things like that to use as examples again to help to explain people on shore what is going on and why it's bad. Sometimes it's true, we break the law. Sometimes it's necessary. I have no problem with stopping the fishing trawlers on the high seas, which I know are creating so much damage to the environment. From the sea to the land, the Rainbow Warrior has been used in the struggle for preservation of ancient rainforests. Discuss this, please. Sure. Remember that I think it's 25% of all the greenhouse gases in the world come from the burning of either the Amazon, the Central African rainforest, or the Indonesian rainforest. It's a dramatic problem. Also remember that when you cut down ancient rainforests, you're destroying what's going on there. In a tropical rainforest, the nutrients are not held in the soil, they're held in the roots of the trees. So chopping down large swaths of the Amazon simply to graze cattle on is a, an absolute waste of a resource. We collectively would do much better to preserve the rainforest and learn how to work with them, not against them. Now some of the actions we've done against this have included the intercepting of ships carrying tropical hardwoods both to Europe and the United States, uh, getting in between the ships, in between the docks they want to go and load at, uh, taking small boats in front of them, doing anything we can to highlight the issue. 
this helps when people in Europe realize that the woods they're buying are by nature destroying the lands in Africa, uh, they, they don't like to buy them as much. And that's, a, that's what we do. We, we use the ships, we intercept ships carrying hardwoods, we go up the Amazon, Rainbow Warriors heading up this new boat, we're heading up the Amazon in a month, and we'll do actions to highlight the degradation that's going on there by overforesting, by foresting in the Amazon. Now you began your seagoing activism by signing on with the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater. Well, I joined the Clearwater in 1973. I was number one in the last draft lottery. And I knew I didn't want to go to Vietnam. Uh, and Clearwater was approved service for conscientious objectors, which I had been able to get. So I thought I would go to Clearwater thinking I would simply take a year off or two before I started college. But I really fell in love with the work. I mean, I've been a sailor all my life. I grew up on the water in Nauwa, Connecticut. My father is still a sailor, advocationally. And I found that sailing, which I love to do, and sailing for a purpose was a very logical combination. And so I became captain of the Clearwater in 76 and stayed on it halfway through the 1980 season. And then when the Rainbow Warrior came over in 1981 and they advertised for crew, I joined right away. I've just, I mean, I feel really fortunate to have found something that uh, keeps my interest and something that I enjoy doing. It's just been a great combination for me. Um, and I've gotten a heck of an education the, uh, by participating in all the Clearwater and Greenpeace campaigns. In 1966, you were involved as a boy with your parents in a civil rights march. Please talk about the, the linkages between the crusade for civil rights and the crusade to preserve a livable environment. Well, first of all, in, in 1965, I was 12. And I had uh, a week off from school. And it was the Selma to Montgomery Civil Rights March. And my father and I flew down and attended the rally that night in Montgomery and then marched in with the marchers towards the state capitol the next morning. And it was certainly an incredible event to be part of. My family had been picketing at Woolworths and, and other civil rights venues for years, so it wasn't a new campaign to me. Um, but it was what was happening at the time. Um, and certainly it's an issue I still feel strongly about. Uh, whether it's South Africa or the Marshall Islands or any place where people aren't being treated fairly. Uh, that particular day, getting to do that, I think piqued my interest. Maybe I could see some, a see a path. Uh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, I still remember the, the optimism that was there that day, the sense that we could change things. Uh, at least that's what I remember being a 12-year-old kid. Uh, it really struck me. I just, I remember it strongly. Um, and it was part of my life growing up. I mean, my family was always politically active. It was just the way we were. And so in between having a mother who was a science teacher in middle school and started an environmental club in 1970, having a father who was... Uh, a co-op organizer and a sailor, I'm doing exactly what I was supposed to be doing, what I, what I was brought up to do. I'm just, again, I feel lucky that I was able to find something that fit me so well. Unlike the two earlier Rainbow Warriors, which were fashioned out of existing vessels, the new Rainbow Warrior has been built especially for Greenpeace. Talk about this, please, and also some of the interesting features, such as energy efficiency. Well, that's correct. The new Rainbow Warrior, we don't really refer to it as number three. Uh, the new Rainbow Warrior is the first ship that we've been able to build from scratch. Uh, we rebuilt the second Rainbow Warrior extensively, but we still took an old hull and fixed it up. The big difference now is that this hull was designed to sail, and she's going to sail much, much better than the old boat ever did. And that's really quite exciting. The rig was designed and the boat was designed by a Dutch naval architect who, I, in my opinion, did a beautiful job. 
Uh, and we all got to add our two cents about what we felt was important and what wasn't. And this is what we've come up with. And it's, a, I think, a real testament to the organization that they took the financial leap and the, the initiative to, to build something. Because it was not easy for us. Greenpeace accepts no government sponsorships, no corporate donations of any kind. It's all small private donation. And this was a big undertaking for us. And I think that uh, at the moment, we're still in the learning how to sail it phase of things. But when we get a handle on it, and we will, uh, it's going to be a remarkable tool. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the energy saving features. One of the things we can do is, and something that's very useful in sailing boats, is if we're able to couple just a little bit of horsepower into the propeller, we get really dramatic gains in performance, much, much more so than just adding more horsepower. So what we're able to do is we have what we call an E-drive or an electric drive motor that's run off our generators hooked to the propeller shaft. And that enables us to put in efficiently one or 200 horsepower into the propeller, which when we're motor sailing gives us really, really uh, increased performance. Uh, that coupled with an underbody that was designed to sail with a keel and the modern rig and we're it's, she's going to do great things for us. Now some people are very pessimistic about the future considering what a mess has been made to so much of the world. You're in the middle of the fight captain. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, I think there's very good reason to be pessimistic. But I have two children. I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful that we created the problems, we can solve them. And I think man's ability to solve problems is, is amazing when we put our mind to it. It's frustrating for me that after all these years about talking about climate change and global warming and the problems they create, that we still have our political leaders who think we can solve our energy problems by drilling for more oil. That's such a basic concept, and yet we know, scientists will tell us, the more oil we burn, the worse climate change gets. Oil is not the future, and coal is even worse. That's one of the things we're talking about on this particular tour, is the problems burning coal creates, and we're still burning a lot of coal in the United States, and we're going to pay for it. Every ton of coal now, we're going to pay for it later. Absolutely, don't be confused. It's not for free. It's not easy. It's not, there's no clean coal. It creates problems. It creates asthma in children, respiratory problems in older people, not to mention the people that go down in the mines and, and risk their lives to dig it out. Uh, it's a product we have to get as far away from as quickly as we can. Even natural gas is a fossil fuel. Even though it's much cleaner than coal, it's not going to meet our energy needs and not going to solve the problems of climate change. We've got to do better. I believe we can, but, but really we haven't really started to try. How can people support the Rainbow Warrior and Greenpeace? Well, next time you're walking down the street, pick up a piece of garbage and throw it in a trash can. I mean, the, the logical question, the logical answer I'm sure is, People expect me to say donate money, but anything you do to make the environment a better place is a huge step forward. And it's something that adds to the life of the person. I think being involved with the environmental movement and the civil rights movement added to my life in fantastic ways. Uh, and anything you can do to get involved in your community, whether it's supporting Greenpeace or any other, I mean, there's so many different environmental groups and they all do particularly good work. Some do different ways than others, and, but there as many environmental groups as for people that want to support them. The best thing you can do, the best thing you can do as a person, I'm convinced, for yourself is to get involved in any extent that you want to, whether it's writing your congressman, recycling a little bit more seriously, picking up trash on the way home, or working your whole life for, a, for an NGO which is what I'm doing, which I, which I love. But there's some way for everybody to get involved. Just to sit back and say, problem's too big for me, I can't do anything. 
you're not going to feel good at the end of the day by taking that attitude. Everybody can find some way to get involved, and that's what I would encourage everybody to do. Specifically, though, Captain, how can people support your ship and Greenpeace? Well, we do take on people for three-month internships. We do hire people that are professionals in the maritime field. We hire campaigners. Greenpeace is a growing organization, and they're, they're jobs for everybody. I mean, they're bookkeepers, they're accountants, they're, they're lawyers, they're scientists, they're everything you can imagine takes into going up to running a, a, a nonprofit like this. If you want to come out on the boat, the best way to do is to become a marine engineer and we'll send a limousine to pick you up because we have a harder time getting marine engineers than anybody else. Uh, if you're a young college student, we take on people on three-month internships. You don't have to be a sailor. You just have to be healthy and, and willing to work. And uh, you'll get flown to wherever the boat is and get us $25 a week or something to cover your expenses while you're on the ship. And you'll see what we do. Uh, um, if you want to just learn about the Rainbow Warrior, you can go on the Greenpeace website and you can look at our internet webcam where wherever we are all over the whole world we take one picture a minute and you can see it on your computer screen you can see what we're doing what's going on on the ship whether we're sailing or motoring whether we're tied to a dock whether we're going up the Amazon or across the ocean you can see what we're doing and lots of people like doing that and there are many ways for people to get involved we have thousands of people who we call cyber warriors that get involved with doing computer actions and petitions and things like that. So there's tons of ways to get involved. Just log into the Greenpeace website. You'll learn all about it. You're away from your family on Rainbow Warrior for months at a time. Is that all right? It's tough. It's tough. Uh, I think I'm really lucky that uh, I've been a single parent for the last seven years and I've spent a lot more time at home with my daughters than I would have otherwise. But uh, they support what I do. And there, my younger daughter was here today doing tours. Uh, they like what I do. I think it's giving them a glimpse of how they can contribute to society and be involved. I think it's been a, a positive thing. So there have been times they've been missing me. There have been times I've been gone. I hope I'll be able to look back in 20 years and say I did the right thing. Uh, we'll see. They're certainly my biggest worry, and they're certainly my biggest motivation. I mean, I'm frankly worried about the future of my kids. What are they going to find? Where, how are they going to live? How will they contribute to society? Where will they be able to live safely? Uh, these are huge questions and I don't have answers, but that's why I'm at Greenpeace because I feel that by being a part of this I'm making a positive statement and doing something useful. Thank you Captain Wilcox for your important work and thank you for watching. This has been Carl Grossman with Enviro Close-Up. To watch this or any Enviro Close-Up, just visit our website at envirovideo.com.